I am now pleased to introduce to you once again, and I need not say anything further about her as you've just heard what an exemplary, distinguished career she has had, our keynote speaker, our commencement speaker for the day, Sharon Pratt. Class of 2011, I'm honored to be here. I also recognize I'm the uh, a person on the program that separates you from your degrees, so I will move with dispatch. I get the point. <laughs> but I am quite honored to be here on this wonderful occasion to be a part of this distinguished community of Cambridge College, which has had such an extraordinary impact in a very short period of time. When you look at all of the institutions that are a part of Boston and Massachusetts, but it is really powerful, the impact your graduates have had, the impact that people have had within the communities where they have traveled. And you have to say that it is a function of the family that constitutes Cambridge College. And that family includes many players, including your distinguished board of trustees, chaired so ably by someone I know so well, Derek Davis. It includes the administration, uh, folks like Pat Den and Susan. But it also now includes a most extraordinary woman. I know a few who are as exceptional as she, as a professional, your new president, Debbie Jackson. But the most important ingredient of what makes it work, it's you, the class of 2011. So when President Jackson asked me to make a few remarks today, and she did emphasize a few remarks, she said, uh, what I'd like you to talk about, Sharon, is to just, just give some highlights of what it's like to face change and what it's like, well, to take on something new. And uh, when you sort of uh, look at my resume, you'll see that I'm still struggling to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> because I've been a practicing lawyer, I've been a uh, law professor, I've been a corporate executive, I've been an elected public official, I've run a nonprofit, and I've, in the midst of it all, been an entrepreneur. And so I can speak with a little authority about what it is to change and take on something new. And for me, I have such an appetite for change, I have little choice. Even if I like not to do it, I almost have to do it. It's a good thing that one kind of likes to do it, because in the world we're living in now, Change is with us all the time. It's so dynamic. But, it, but as I say, I'm someone who has lived at an age that surpasses most of the established speed limits. And so, so I will just give a couple of vignettes. And what I want to speak to in terms of taking on change, taking on a whole new path, which you did just coming here, you've done it as you leave here, and as what's unfolding for you uh, in the days ahead. I think you've got to have about four points that I want to make, four ingredients. You've got to have gumption and guts. Just to do it, you've got to have gumption and guts. Number two, you've got to take on, you've got to be able to manage adversity. And adversity may come in many forms, if we live long enough, sometimes even if we don't live long enough, we'll get hit with it. Whether it's a personal challenge, a health challenge, or whatever it is, you've got to be able to manage it. Thirdly, you've got to listen to that inner voice. You've got to trust and follow your instincts. You've got to hear it and embrace it. And then the last thing I want to make, point I want to make, you've got to be able to make a friend and not be disturbed by your companion of fear. Because if you step out on new trails and have the nerve and gumption to try a new path, 
you will know fear. And you've got to recognize there's a friend in that presence of fear because that's your source of adrenaline. Now, early on in my life, I started out as a practicing lawyer, mainly because daddy didn't have any sons uh, <laughs> as the real reason. <laughs> and um, so I, did, I got a migraine working for daddy. And so um, <laughs> uh, I decided I wanted to try to do something else. And so there was a brand new law school that Antioch was starting, Antioch College. And what I loved about this law school, it had a whole new philosophy of education, but I, which I think you at Cambridge can appreciate. They would determine that everybody would have hands-on exposure. It would be practical. They would not just learn in the classroom. Oh, it was exciting, and they'd be an instrument of change. I was 28 years old. I just loved it. I knew, as my sister Benny's here today, she knows I always think I'll be perfect at it. I just knew that I would be able to do this job, so I applied. I got this most wonderful response that basically said, I don't think so. <laughs> and which really distressed me, so I tried to figure out how do I get past this rejection. It never occurred to me to accept the rejection. I just tried to figure out how to get past it. So I discovered why they had said no. They said, number one, you're younger than half of the class and you basically haven't done anything in life, which was true. Number two, we have already established great intellectuals, really established scholars from University of Chicago and Yale. You know, we are impressed with your education, but it's not quite there. And then thirdly, we're an institution that's about really being an agent of change. We've got people who put their lives on the line for the things they believe in, so most of the students had been activists. And it was clear, I didn't qualify on any of those, by those metrics, but that didn't stop me. I went to the deans, I challenged the deans, I said that you can't just judge me by some type of social stereotype. I've got a lot of energy, I've got a lot of drive, I'm going to be an agent of change, you've got to give me a chance. And and it worked. They accepted me. And I got to be a part of that exciting faculty. Now, that doesn't mean that. I wasn't terrified when I walked in those faculty meetings with all these people that were scholars, that I, when I faced my students, half of them of whom had, most of whom had been activists who'd really done something in their lives. And when you challenge them, they were gonna come back at you. But the point of it is, I did it. I got it done. I was able to win the respect of the faculty, to win the respects of the students, but the most important thing about that gumption and guts to go forward, I won the respect of me, my respect. I began to have faith in my ability to get it done. And then the second uh, point is really managing adversity. No matter how hostile and tough the environment, being able to still make it work for you. When I left Antioch, I decided to go to a totally different world. I joined the electric utility. Now, you know that's a totally different world. And it was just a company then in the 70s, and it was a company basically of engineers. And they had very few, if any, hardly any people of color and no women, hardly at all. And yet, I felt I can still make it work here. It was a hostile environment. When I say hostile, it was hostile. They had, up until the 70s, they'd had separate picnics for people of color. I mean, it was unreal. Uh, they, when, the, when, the, when the community of color got upset, they said, we'll give you a Pepco gospel choir. It was really out of another time. But nonetheless, as hostile as the environment was, you know, I took advantage of whatever opportunities I had. Long and short of it, they assigned me to, to be the lawyer and personnel. 
And then I was in the lawyer of personnel. I found out this company was having one Title VII problem after the other. I mean, they were discriminating against women and people of color and on age. I mean, you name it. And I said, look, guys, you're going to really have a problem. I raised it. Nobody wanted to hear it. I raised it to the general counsel. He didn't want to hear it. I raised it to the most senior African-American at the company who was being groomed to be vice president. He didn't want to hear it. And then I tried to figure out, what do I do with these facts? Do I just be quiet? After all, I'm so far down in the system. Who will notice? Well, here is where I say adversity worked. I just come out of Antioch Law School. I just come out of an institution where people had put their lives on the line for the things they believed in. And I was going to, I couldn't possibly just sit here, have these facts, and say one day I did nothing with it. So I decided I'll write a memo to the president of the company. He, I may lose my job, but at least I'll have my integrity intact. I, So I wrote this memo to the CEO. I was lucky he was not an engineer, he was a lawyer. <laughs> I was also lucky he was a politician himself and knew enough to pay attention to uh, the pulse of the people. He summoned me to his office. I mean, you would have thought a bomb had gone off in Pepco when they heard I'd been summoned to his office. Long and short of it, I made my case. He explained why I'd skipped over all of the, uh, the, the, the chain of command and come to him tried not to malign anybody along the way, basically didn't tell him that he had a company of bigots, I didn't say that, uh, but just talked about how they were still struggling with some new realities. And I have to say that as a result of having, doing that and taking on that kind of adversity, without a doubt, that moment established my career. He kept, he would invite me back on different issues, Next thing I know, I was the first woman who was the head of any kind of, had an, any kind of executive position, and then the first woman in the history of the 100-year-old company to be an officer. That adversity worked for me. And then the third one, and, and I do want to, I'm going to put a footnote in it when I finally finish about fear. Because you know it all, I'm giving you the highlights. Nobody stands up at commencement and tells you about all of the flops and, and, and struggles and the moments all along the way. But that happened to work. The good Lord was with me. That one worked. The next time that soon thereafter, though I was being groomed to be the, one of the top executives, I decided for a reason, if I live to be a hundred, I'll never know, I decided I was going to run for mayor of Washington, D.C. I don't know what on earth possessed me <laughs> to do that. I had been active in politics, helped bring about home rule, been married to an elected official, managed campaigns, but always up until that moment had the sense to know that you don't want to be the elected official. <laughs> and so I don't even know what possessed me to do it as against staying maybe at Pepco where I had a secure career now uh, and just taking this on. Every, everybody then was terrified of running. Marion Barry was the established political player. He had a tremendous, he was like Dick Daly. He really controlled the politics of the city. The four of the people who were running were either on the council waiting for his endorsement on the, in Congress waiting for his endorsement they had the means by which to raise money. They had the means by which to uh, get endorsements. I was two and a half years out. I had no money, no endorsements, and as far as most people considered, no chance. And yet, there was something in me saying, this is what I'm supposed to do. So I started going out there, talking to people, above all, listening to people. And what I was saying and what they were saying, we were together. So, you know, and they'd say, you know, it's great. You really got some good ideas. It's too bad you can't win. <laughs> and then that happened for two and a half years. There were almost nobody anywhere that could raise money. I could come up to Boston. They raised some money, Benny and Flash and some others. They helped me raise some money. 
But the long and short of it is, two and a half years out, I'd go from door to door. I was sort of like Robin Hood. I'd gather up volunteers along the way. And eventually, we had a hand of really a band of volunteers. They didn't even bother to include me in the polls, I'm telling you. They didn't even bother to acknowledge it. And yet, that group kept saying to ourselves, we can do this. It is possible. We can feel it. It's supposed to happen. Finally, long story short, about 10 days out, they have the first televised debate. I said, now this one, I, this is good. Came out of that televised debate, heck, I had nothing to lose. I was the most relaxed person up on the stage. I had no endorsement to lose, no money to lose. <laughs> so I just kept doing those zinging them, you know, with my views. When the cameramen started laughing with what I was saying, I said, well, this must be working. I came home that night, I got a call from a friend who said, congratulations, Sharon. I said, you felt I won that televised debate? She said, Sharon, you also got the Washington Post endorsement. So that was sort of, and then from there, a, a variety of debates. And then finally, 8 o'clock arrived on election day, and there was nothing more we could do. It was all over. You just... You just have to say it's in the good Lord's hands, which is where it was all along. About 15 minutes after 8, the first early returns came on the radio. I was in my little car heading down to the party, quote unquote, and it hurt, that hurt. I was 15 points, like 15 points ahead in the returns. I came to a light, I hit that brake, I opened that door, I jumped out the middle of 16th Street, <laughs> it was a glorious moment. It was all for all of us who kept having the faith to trust that instinct when there was nothing, absolutely nothing anywhere to say that we could do it. Which brings me to my last point. You've got to know and not be troubled by your fellow passenger called fear. Because if you step there out there on faith, when you're doing things just from sheer unbridled gumption, when you're doing it just when you're dealing with all kinds of adversity and you don't know if you can manage it, can I pay those bills in the morning? Will I fall on my face and embarrass myself? Have I made a turn from which my career, my life cannot recover? You will know fear. Fear, though, is the discipline that builds character, muscles in your character. Fear is what gets you pumped up and gets you going each and every day. And when you look that fear in the face, eye to eye, and know, hey, I'm going to do it, I'm going to make it, so that when I won, I used an expression then that a person who since won for president kind of used sometimes that applies to us today. Whatever it is, when we have the gumption and guts, have the faith in our instincts, deal with that adversity, we look that fear right in the eye and we say, yes, we can and yes, we will. Class of 2011, you've already done it, so we already know, yes, you can, and yes, you will.